Brought to you by Moonbeam Multimedia. This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. Well, I'm starting my summer with a sinus event as normal. <laughs> Your semi biannual sinus event, uh-huh. quarterly annual. What's yeah, I would say, say it's that? like six to twelve Three, times a year. No, it actually has dropped. Um, oh, good. Maybe this is like the fourth time in a year. Okay. So quarterly. So it's not from, you can't blame it on your students this time, though. No, but I can blame it on the six streets of New York City. Okay. And that's what I'm choosing to do. I got it. I got it. So, yeah, we were in New York City. We were seeing a musical. Suffs. Suffs. And, and they just gonna, won two Tonys. They, sh- they sure did. Shana Taub did, yes. And we'll, we'll probably talk about that a little bit more later on, right? Oh. Okay. So we'll revisit Suffs. But yes, we spent a, a couple of days in New York with our friends. I think we mentioned we were going to do this. We did. Our friends from out west, and we had a great time hanging out with them. It was a very empowering, just a lovely group of women. And I, I walked away from it the days there feeling inspired. I did too. I laughed a lot. Yes, it was a very good time. Had a great time. Yeah. So summer is off to a fast start. It sure is. The first couple of weeks have zoomed by. I yeah. don't like that. I hope it slows down a little now. Me too. Enjoying the pool, enjoying the weather. I have a lot of work I need to do, and I've done none of yeah, it. Yeah, you've got homework. And my mom keeps telling me to do my homework, <laughs> and I keep saying, yeah, mom, and then I definitely don't do my homework. Okay. So when she wants to hang out and I can't, I'm going to have to be like, I didn't do my homework. So if you're a student listening to this podcast on education, teaching, and learning, do as the teacher says, not as she does. Oh, please don't ever do as I do. <laughs> How's your summer? Oh, it's going really well. I've been enjoying moments of relaxation. I'm trying to get slightly less ghostly white. How's it going? I'm I'm almost... What is the... What do you suppose this... uh, Like the shades of ivory of cosmetics. Like what's the one below the white, brightest white? You are about the color of a porcelain doll (laughs) found in a... Been sitting in bleach. (laughs) It's been sitting in an attic without the sun for... 85 years. Okay. So I'm a little dusty. I was doing less with the dust, more with that you haven't seen the light of day in 85 years. Uh-huh. Okay. But you are you are so the you color could, of a Victorian doll. You could hold me up to some printer paper and there would be a competition. A comparison could be made. Okay. So anyway, I'm working on that. I'm excited for you. You're Thank you. There. Me too. I'm really Maybe working on it. Maybe you'll pass me one of these years. <laughs> that will never happen. Okay. What are we up to this week? This is our year in review. Yes. Uh, version three. We're, it's a tradition. Volume three? Volume three. Volume it's a three. tradition now. We didn't do it the very first year in for some reason. We only came up with it. Well, we'd only been podcasting for like six months. No, that's not it. I mean, by that, I mean the first full, full year. Full year. Because we do it at the end of the school year for the U.S., which is typically around the beginning of June. So I, sometimes I forget how long we've been doing yeah, this. Yeah, we've been doing this for a while. But this is our third our third annual year in review, and this is a, an episode where we take a moment to look back on what we have learned, both on the pod, but just in our own lives over the past year or so. Yeah. A little bit more casual episode to give ourselves a bit of a break for the summer, because we like to lay back too, and we don't usually take other times off during the school year, so kind of a fun episode for us. We're just going to go back and forth. We're going to skip the education news headlines for this week. Though, before we get into it, I do just want to say, sign up for the 16 to 1 podcast email newsletter. That's on our website, 16 to 1.com. All spelled out. Scroll down. You can sign up for the newsletter. You can get the latest episode announcements, resources, and workshop offerings from Moonbeam Multimedia. And speaking of Moonbeam Multimedia, that is us. We, are the, we started a company, Moonbeam Multimedia. We told you about this about a year ago, and we've made some updates since then. I do want to share those as part of our year in review. So we've expanded our mission a bit. We now are doing research and development work in social impact areas, but we're especially focusing on schools and libraries. As you might imagine, that's kind of where our expertise lies. We've added a couple new team members to Moonbeam Multimedia, and we're going to be launching soon some professional development workshops and policy institutes. You can find more out about that on our website, moonbeammultimedia.com. Again, that's the company that 
operates 16 to 1 podcast. So if you have any interest in that, go ahead and check it out. But yeah, we're up to all sorts of things. We have an educational use of AI policy institute. We have an educational materials review policy institute, and that's about empowering educational communities to approach book challenges and materials review processes with integrity and inclusivity. And then we also have a community engagement and insight series that's designed to get meaningful dialogue started in school districts to help them inform levy processes. So we've talked a lot about school fundraising, public school fundraising on this show. So now we're just putting a little bit of structure around engagement around those issues. So that's kind of what we've been up to. We've been developing those things over the past year or so. We'll see where it goes. And thanks for sticking with us through, through our year of growth. Yeah, another year. Okay, are we ready to get into what we've been learning over the past year or so? Yeah. Okay. Why don't you kick us off? Okay. Okay. Well, actually, that's this is good, because we both read this book. Oh, what's that? I went back through my Goodreads list and just kind of pulled from some of the things that I'd read about, and um, then... Yeah, you had the same you had the same idea I did. Yeah, I think I saw it Or I had you. the same idea you I did. I think you did it, and I was like, that's a good idea. So I started there, and then I also just pulled in some other things I've learned. So, the first book... On my list is a book called Atomic Habits, An Easy and Proven Way to Build Good Habits and Break Bad Ones by James Clear. I'm not going to tell you the whole book because I think that's kind of what's important about the book. But if you know me personally, you certainly know this. If you don't, you've probably figured it out. I am a creature of habit, good and bad habits. I will confirm that you are a creature of habit, yes. I've been diagnosed with OCD. And so for better or for worse, habits are part of my life. And so this book actually really kind of helped me navigate my OCD diagnosis. Interesting. And they helped me realize that some of my habits are good and and they do good things for me and some of them are not good. He basically has like three lessons. The first one is that small habits make a big difference. The second one is that you should forget about setting goals and then focus on your system instead. Hmm. And then the third one is to build identity-based habits. I am someone who sometimes gets too focused on just the end result and accomplishing something. Uh I am a checkmark person. You know this about me. Yeah, you me. like to check things off of lists. You have lists in your head and you... But even like fun things, I do that too. Oh, yeah. Like a Lego set. As soon as I start it, it needs to be done. <laughs> I Completionist. Can't, I can't enjoy the process. Mm-hmm. And that's what's fun. This book kind of helped me realize that in setting goals, I don't actually always set myself up to accomplish something long term, but just to kind of crash through it and finish it, but not actually make any changes that hold me mm-hmm. to these things, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? No, it does. I had an interesting relationship with this book, too. The very first point stuck with me because I have, I tend to have a lot of shame around my inability to commit to, like, big changes or habits that I want to form, like, for health or whatever these things are. And this book definitely helped me identify the fact that even a little bit of progress is still the progress that you're making. Sure. And you should definitely make the little bit of progress yeah. now And not put off the bigger chunk of progress that you think you could make later. Right. (laughs) And so that was an important takeaway. It definitely helped me parse up goals Mm -hmm. to see different types of accomplishment and what that could look like on smaller scales, which I think is important because I'm a big picture person. And a lot of times big picture takes a long, long time to get to. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have a great sense of accomplishment until then. And so this book kind of helped me find ways to break down these big picture goals, these checklist things, these whatever, into actually more manageable bites to get mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. It also is a way for me to say, you know, if you're someone who's diagnosed with OCD, like me, you are ruled by habits in every way, even ones you don't realize are habits are, you know, are habits. And so it kind of helped me contextualize that I can use it for good. And I can find harmful ones and fix those. And and that was good for me. I needed that. Because I, I become very, very rigid. If I come home and I can't do all of my things in order, I'm, routine. I'm thrown off for mm-hmm. the night. Like, my night is ruined. And uh, I don't have to be that way. Not that having OCD is a choice, but mm-hmm. this this kind of thinking has helped me shift to say, the habits that I have can happen. Uh-huh. At different points. But in my head, it was always, I come home and I do these exact things. Uh But in reality, I can have something come up and still complete my tasks and it not be a failure of whatever. Sorry to cut you off. No, no. I was just going to say, I I remember the first time that you explained that 
the coming home from school and you're like unpacking and tidying up routine. And I, I didn't get it at the time, but then I thought more about it and I thought about my inability to like walk away from work and like disconnect myself from work <laughs> and how off it makes me feel if I'm preoccupied with the thing that I didn't get done at work. There is no downtime when you feel like you've got some sort of thing hanging over you yeah. that you need to get done. So that's I, how I get it. I'm certainly someone when I have any kind of chore. Yeah. It's the first thing I get done yeah. because I cannot enjoy any time until it's done. Yeah. So this book yep. is, I still have some work to do, obviously, but this book is, um, it's probably one I should go back and reread. Yeah. It is certainly an interesting conversation yeah. around habits and it did help me. It helped me find some slightly less stress inducing ways of, <laughs> of dealing with stuff in my own life. For so. sure. Yeah. All right, what you got? Well, so as you can probably tell, I've been doing a lot of thinking about artificial intelligence and generative AI, just because it's so very inescapably present in in the media and in Silicon Valley. And then it seems like everywhere it's getting shoved into our faces from every angle. It's going to be in all of our computers and our phones and everything. And we're not going to be able to turn it off soon because it is... Lucky us. The thing, apparently. But we've also been developing this educational use of AI policy workshop. So we've been doing a lot of research around AI. And what I've noticed so far is that all we have are the, like the tech evangelists talking about how it's the, the greatest thing since sliced bread. And a couple of takeaways that I've got about AI right now. The first is that a lot of people are trying to use it to do things that it wasn't designed to do and is not capable of. And I think this is almost solely the fault of the companies developing these things and pushing them out <laughs> into the public as quickly as they can. And it's a marketing problem. It's being talked about like this miracle cure for every bit of work that we do. And it just is not. It's not. It's not that. And, and it can't be. Yeah. And it's also, it has a huge problem with its relationship to the content that it uses to to function and that's content that's created by everybody who's put something on the internet <laughs> there's a big plagiarism problem we've talked a lot about that on this show there's also just this problem of how how it's kind of deceptively marketing itself so that that's going on the other thing that i think is that i'm learning more about and and trying to learn more about is the environmental cost of artificial intelligence the data centers required to power this stuff, the, the power required to make it all go is so immense that even Sam Altman, the open AI guy, he has claimed that it's going to take a breakthrough in nuclear fusion technology to power the demand Oh my gosh. for artificial intelligence. And in fact, he's invested in, I think I was just reading the other day, he's invested in fusion power startups to that, to the end of for that reason. cornering that market. Because what's coming. Yeah. I mean, their data center is going up everywhere there's one going up in our town actually just newly announced microsoft data center so there's going to be just a huge strain on what i think is a power grid that can't probably support the strain so it's going to be interesting to see where this goes over the next couple of years but yeah if you're interested in learning more about ai generative ai we're, we're working on the policy institute around this discussion yeah. um, and how it impacts schools and educators and students and how we should think about these things in the context of learning, because as I said before, I do think these tools can be valuable to learners, to educators. But I think until we have some more frank conversations around what these tools are capable of truly and in, in an honest way, I don't know that we're going to be able to tap into the potential that they, they do have. So because of that. Tech people are crippling themselves by trying to pretend like it does more than it actually does. But, sure. but I think there are really interesting use cases for it, but it's not to make weird looking Photoshop generated sure. fake rip off other people's art and poetry and things like that. I think that's not, I don't think the best use of generative AI is going to be in replacing creative work. Yeah, I think I agree that, with that people are creators and that's going to become more and more apparent as we go on and... If we don't invest in people as creators, this this whole anyway, I just you know I'm on a soapbox about sure. that. But I understand. But human human people, uh, human but art shouldn't be what we're replacing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's I don't I think agree. we should re be replacing art. I think we should be solving interesting problems that require computing power that like our brains can't detect certain patterns or whatever it may sure. be. Like there really is opportunity there, but it's not in these kind of like parlor trick 
gimmicks that are yeah. sweeping the market right now. So anyway, that's what I've been thinking about. Yeah. All right. Back to you. Something else I've read about recently. Yes. The Provisional Irish Republican Army. That I was something I did not know enough about. I still don't know enough about, but I'm learning about. And all the groups that want to reunite Ireland and how this is still an ongoing issue, obviously. And I'd seen headlines about these things, obviously, in the news. I knew that one portion was under British rule and one wasn't. Like, I understood all of that. But I read a book called Say Nothing, A True Story of Murder and Memory in Northern Ireland by Patrick Radden Keefe. And it tells the story of a woman named Jean McConville and her abduction. And it kind of goes through how so many crimes that were occurring in neighborhoods because of the, the reunification efforts and this huge separation in Ireland and Northern Ireland, that when crimes would, have, would occur, people were living in such fear and paranoia that no one would speak of it. So there are all of these crimes and stories, things coming to light even still, that never did before because of the fear of the IRA and things like that. And so I have a lot of learning still to do. Yeah. I'll be the first to say. You know what got me into learning about that? Dairy Girls, that show. I know. I need to watch that. So I still have a lot to learn, obviously. But this is kind of an effort of mine. And in this book, Say Nothing by Patrick Graden Keefe was, was a great start. Interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to it later. But I also have been trying to learn more about history that I should definitely know more about than I do. For sure. <laughs> just, that's been like, that's been a theme. Of Actually, my year. next few are about history I should have known more about. Yes. So yeah. Yes. Um, okay, next thing I've learned about, and this is related to the artificial intelligence conversation, because without big data, there is no artificial intelligence. But I've been learning a lot about data. <laughs> I've been working on some data engineering projects. I've been doing things with data that I find interesting, learning a lot about it, trying to understand it. I also read The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff. It explores how our data is being used by tech companies everywhere to create a new economic system that is often very much in tension with privacy and perhaps the exercise of democracy. So, you know, this is a, a lot to think about. But I'm also recently reading this book that I've had for a while, and I tried to start reading it once, and I couldn't do it. But after seeing Suffs last week, I've recommitted myself to it because I need to read it. Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men by Caroline Criado Perez. This deals with gender bias in data collection, which leads to all kinds of interesting and systemic disadvantages for women. It covers everything from like healthcare to urban planning. It's a pretty interesting book. That's where I'm spending my time learning about (laughs) big data right now. But yeah, that's been uh, that's been a part of my learning over the past Sounds year. Sounds interesting. Yeah, it's it's can be very technical at times. Sure. These are difficult books to tackle. Also, the age of surveillance capitalism was hella long. I think it took like twenty eight hours worth of audio book or something. We did that in the car last summer, actually. But very interesting book. Okay, Please report back. I will so report I can back. Learn and not read the twenty eight hour book. I I will Thank give you. you my book report. Next interesting book. Yes. It was called Codename Lease, The True Story of the Woman Who Became World War II's Most Highly Decorated Spy by Larry Loftus. It's about a woman named Odette Sanson who wanted to follow in her dad's footsteps by becoming basically a spy to support Britain and to help France. So this is during World War II, and she ended up becoming the most decorated spy. She was constantly on the run. She was imprisoned in Ravensbrück, which is one of the Nazi concentration camps. And she was eventually liberated and even went and testified against the Nazis. Wow. She is like as badass as it gets. She was like just so dedicated to becoming a spy and doing the work and getting involved. If you love war stories, it's really good at that. Her love story runs throughout it because she met her husband while doing this work. Wow. And what's cooler than a woman who ends up testifying against Nazis? How are we getting so many inspiring stories about women all at once? I I feel lucky. She's so cool. I feel lucky to be experiencing this moment. But that's her, Odette Sanson. Interesting. Yeah, it's a great book. What else you got? I'm learning about the death of Web 2.0, which is the web that we grew up with 
and we emerged into adulthood with Web 2.0, the social internet, the the e-commerce era, the first wave of living our entire lives online. Gotcha. So yeah, so I. So it's what we've been doing. Yeah, yeah, it's the end of that era. I personally think, especially with what AI is doing and how even how Google is changing and just the way things are evolving. Uh, the internet is going to fundamentally change. The way that you can make money online is going to fundamentally change with generative AI if if the big tech giants keep developing things the way they're developing. So just... Really? Yeah. I just I was just reading an article the other day about how perplexity, which is another AI-driven research tool, supposedly, they're just taking content from, I think it was Forbes. They were republishing information from Forbes in these little like oh wow summary page things and people were like hey that's Forbes paywall content and they're like yeah we are we will deal with that somehow we're going to fundamentally change the way publishers make money on the internet and i'm like yeah you sure are because if they don't get any web traffic they're not going to make any money on the internet so anyway these wow. companies are trying to now they're like scrambling to make deals with publishers you know reddit made a deal these different companies are making deals with companies like OpenAI and Perplexity and all these other things, content licensing agreements, because these generative AI things have scraped all the information anyway. And now they're like, ooh, we're going to get cut. And uh, what do we do about this? Uh -oh. but there's a lot of legal gray zone about yeah. what all of this is and what it represents. And anyway, I think what we're going to see is a huge sea change in the way the web is monetized and therefore we're going to change the way we interact with the internet and it's going to happen in the next 10 years. Wow. It's going to be weird. It's going to be a difficult change. I think there are going to be a lot of companies that just cease to exist because of some of these changes. But I think the most interesting consequence of all of this that I am picking up on now is that there's a certain level of disinformation at which the exercise of democracy might become impossible and we might be approaching that not to be completely fatalist and scary about it but i but i do think we have a big problem <laughs> and i think we need to address it systemically okay well, yeah i'm not going to think about that at all well i mean um. and i think this is a really big problem for for education because i think part of combating this is you know encouraging critical thinking and media literacy and all of the things that you do in a good English class about how to analyze text and where it came from and who the audience is and who sure. the speaker is. I'm just and, not interested in living through the fall of democracy. Yeah, no, I'm not either. But I, yeah, I think it's time for us to take more seriously some regulatory efforts around AI and stuff. I think it's just going to be an interesting, turbulent time. But anyway, that wraps okay, up then. my year of learning about technology. <laughs> Okay. Okay, back to you. Anyways. For more uplifting things. Okay, my next book. This is by Brian Stevenson, and it's called Just Mercy. I've heard of this one. This has been on my list for so long. A bunch of teachers I work with recommended it, but also told me that it is heavy. You had to be in the right headspace for it? You do. So Brian Stevenson established the Equal Justice Initiative, and the book tells the story of one of their first clients, who is Walter McMillan, a young black man who was sentenced to die for the murder of a young white woman that he didn't commit the crime. The work of the book is to show how the death penalty in America is a direct descendant of lynching and how it represents a system that treats the rich and the guilty better than the poor and the innocent. Through the book, while you're reading about Walter McMillan, you're also learning about the work of the Equal Justice Initiative, the EJI, and so the EJI still to this day, uh, they exist and they're doing tons of great work with Brian Stevenson still. And they work to help criminal justice reform. They help support racial justice, anti-poverty, and they also engage pretty heavily in public education. They create educational units for books like Just Mercy. And so, like I said today, you can find support and then follow their website. There is opportunities for teachers to get support ideas for teaching about these issues, and especially if you wanted to teach Just Mercy. And still to this day, they are focusing on especially reducing those children that are imprisoned in adult centers, and still to this day, fighting against the death penalty. Interesting. So, the book is not easy, but it is worth it, and it really helped me shape some thoughts. We were talking about history that we didn't know enough about. Mm -hmm. 
certainly lynching is one of those topics for me that I did not know and still do not know enough about. But it, but it does a good job of meeting you where you are yeah, to help unlearn and relearn. Interesting. Yeah, it's a great book. Yeah, I've heard about that one. I think I need to add it to my reading list. It's also a movie. I haven't watched it, but it's on my list for sure. So outside of technology. Okay, yeah, but what I have you learned? I actually lied a little bit. It's still about more technology. technology. Okay, Great. here I'm we sorry. go. I'm sorry. I was learning a lot about social media, social capital, and the intersection of those things. The first book of these two books I have not finished yet. Full disclosure, it is another big book. It's a very important book in sociology. It's called Bowling Alone by Robert D. Putnam. I've talked about it before. It examines the decline of social capital in America, highlighting how decreased civic engagement and community participation have weakened the social fabric and affected various aspects of society. I also read, and I did finish this one, finally. I've been talking about it for the last couple weeks, The Anxious Generation by Jonathan Haidt. Remember how I told you I might be convinced about how we maybe should completely ban smartphones from schools, depending Uh on this guy? I think he he might be winning me over... A little bit. I agree with what I heard. Here's the distinction that he helped me make that I hadn't been able to make for myself before. We didn't grow up with the most pernicious kind of technology that is causing the mental health crisis among youths now. It happened after. It happened starting in like 2010. Right. And I was like, that can't possibly be because I had a smartphone when I was in high school. So the social media and the culture thereof did not exist when I thought it did, because it's been around for so long that I've just felt it's been pretty ubiquitous. But we did not have to endure a middle school existence of like Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat. That wasn't there for our most awful sensitive years of development when stuff can go horribly wrong. That being said, the recommendations in this book are basically like no social media until high school at least like 16 smartphones maybe 16 might be a good target right now in terms of data collection and processing the united states sort of treats kids as young as 13 as Uh people capable of giving consent for their data to be harvested that is a little freaky when you think about it (laughs) A, a lot freaky anyway I definitely recommend the book because it talks about the ways these things can impact learning and young people and what happens in schools. It's very relevant to to educators, to parents, to people who are working with kids, especially. He's really focused on um, younger generations, how this has impacted Gen Z and younger. He says that maybe like the tail end of millennials might have gotten some of the negative effects of this sort of thing growing up, but we mostly skipped over it. Interesting. And that does track with what you and I have talked about as our experience. We're like, oh, it wasn't that bad. Yeah, it wasn't that bad. We did not have the things that are, according to the data presented in this book, are primarily responsible for the biggest problems of social media. And those problems are sleep deprivation and decreased real world interactions and interference with youth development and well-being and a broad mental health crisis among younger generations. Uh-huh. That's that's the consequence and we that we really don't even realize that we're paying yet because there's so much pressure. The other point that I took away from the book was this requires a a whole community to get on board with doing something like banning smartphones until kids are 16 because if you you do it just like one off, your kid's going to be like, well, everybody else has the phone. I don't want to be the one who's left out of the social whatever environment because I don't have a smartphone. And that's a totally valid feeling. Like, no, no, especially people that age do not want to be left out of what is happening in, in the social yeah. current, and that is happening on smartphones and on social media now. I will admit that I was very persuaded by this book. Okay, I really think I'm done with technology okay, now. We'll Would you like to that? go? Okay, well, I guess we will. What What about you? What's your next thing? My next one is Two Combined. Okay. This is from an author I found on TikTok. Her name is Dr. Susie Edge. She has a few books out, but the two I read were Mortal Monarchs and Vital Organs. Oh, uh huh. And so the Mortal Monarchs book, it brings up all of these like weird body parts and things that we've learned about the body and organs and things like that. Okay, so these books are kind of related, even though they didn't necessarily. Okay, I get it. Uh-huh. There's a theme. So the Monarchs one is about 
Edward the Second or whatever. And so it's like every little chapter is about a different monarch and some ailment or whatever. So there was like a whole thing about the Habsburgs and, you know, uh, yes. just all the things of ailing monarchs and what they've done to themselves by breeding so closely. You do love to read about old weird monarchies. I do. The second book is called Vital Organs. It's some myth and some legend and some real. It's also just her approach to learn more about the stories of bodies and how they work and how we've learned what we've learned about them. So I love Susie Edge's TikTok and that's what got me into it. I love books that will help me win a trivia night. Yes. That's what both of these books have done for me. They're really fun and she reads them herself. And it's just a really interesting look into like these morbid facts so when you consider someone like Henry VIII, right, King Henry VIII, he was like this womanizer and all these things, but he was actually like dying slowly of like a rotting leg and probably like at least one STD. At least. Minimum. It's just an interesting perspective. She's done some really interesting work. She was trained as a molecular biologist and then she moved into clinical medicine because she wanted to talk to people and not just work with test tubes. So... She's worked in a variety of uh, medical specialties, including infectious diseases, hematology, trauma, and orthopedic surgery, and now also works and researches as a historian. Hmm. Really interesting. Yeah, she's really fun. I like so. the cross-disciplinary approach to the work. That's I cool. I do, too. I'll include her TikTok in the uh, show notes. Okay, now what if not technology? It's not technology. It's not. I've been thinking about and learning about creativity I did mention this one on the show. I read The Creative Act by Rick Rubin, which is just kind of a meditation on the nature of creativity. He emphasizes that creativity is a process that's accessible to everyone. He encourages people to find and nurture their own creative expressions. And I guess this has an implication for, for education and educators as well. But it made me think about how we ought to try to make it less risky for people to be creative. Oh, yeah, I like that. We don't want to make it so safe that it becomes uninteresting to pursue creative work. But I do think that we're we're a little bit obsessed with efficiency. We're a little bit obsessed with work. And not that we shouldn't be focused on those things and helping students develop skills to do those things. But we also should be helping students develop skills for living and fulfillment, you know, in a soul way for rather, sure. rather than only an economic way. So I think what we should probably be thinking more about uh, dedicating time and space to allowing people to develop their creativities in whatever way that might be. Yeah, I think that's great. I don't think it should come at great personal risk or cost to pursue creativity for anybody who might want to. So. That was one of the things actually that Jonathan Groff mentioned in his Tony acceptance speech. Yeah. His acceptance speech was talking about how he had a family that allowed him to pursue creativity and the arts and whatever mm -hmm. and um, how difficult that is. Yeah, I just think about how much more art and how many more interesting things we would be able to experience if it weren't quite so risky to be sure. a creative. I mean, and I'm kind of talking about being a professional creative, but not even necessarily that. If we could make it easier for kids to pursue art or music or whatever it may be, if we could increase opportunities to do that kind of stuff and not treat it as a nice sugar on top of yeah. which is kind of how the arts are sometimes treated, especially in public school funding capacities something that not everybody gets to do. So they're kind of exclusive. And I just, it makes me wonder how much richer our lives could be if we could experience more creativity from more people more of the time. For sure. Okay, back to you. Did you know that there was a methane fire at the 1981 Indianapolis 500? I might have seen a video of this. I didn't understand what I was uh -huh. looking at. Same. Okay. Okay. So that's what happened to me. Uh huh. I was like, "What are these people running from?" You did the you did the thing that I should have done, which is to figure out what you were looking at. It was a methanol fire. That's wild. And because in the daylight it burns blue and white, you can't see it. Okay. This video was of what I thought were these people looking ridiculous, just yeah. running around, their hands up in the air, like all of this stuff. It was a methanol fire, and it was started because of well, at the time, the way that they refueled. The cars. Wow. And actually, because of this incident, they changed how those parts work so as not to be as big of a risk. Interesting. This particular incident was because fuel began to go out from the refueling hose as it was loosely attached to the car of Rick Mears, who was the driver. And at first, the pit crew couldn't understand what happened. One of them even tried to take off the driver, Mears' helmet, 
Another one who was covered in fuel started calling for help. Mears, the driver, starts running around and finds a uh, extinguisher and uses it on himself. Wow. Because so few people, unless you were on fire, you didn't really understand what was happening. Of course. He ended up having to undergo plastic surgery on his face because of the incident. Oh, wow. But it did lead to a fuel nozzle design change. I don't think I'll ever be around it. I hope I'm not. <laughs> Methane But now fire. I know if someone says that they're on fire and I can't see it, I should at least consider it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Before I wouldn't have. Yeah. But at least it did lead to change. I'm glad you did the research so that I could learn that as well. Yeah. And the driver, Rick Mears, said that his dad was running to him and he was running away from the fire, but he was also on fire. And he was like, I knew my dad would know something was wrong because I don't run. <laughs> This doesn't happen. Cracks me Do up. something. That's like such like a slam too. It's like such a dad thing to be like, mm-hmm. oh, this guy doesn't run. Mm-hmm. So he must be on fire. That sounds like something your dad might do. It absolutely is something my dad would do. So I'm circling back to my desire to learn more about history, especially in weak spots of mine. And one of those weak spots is in American history, kind of from right before I was born up to now and how we got into our current political dysfunction. I wanted to understand better American politics and economics, too, in the kind of recent past. So I read a couple of books that were helpful for that. The first one was called Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America by Kurt Anderson. I got into this one because I was looking at a lot of education statistics that started to go wonky post-1980s, and that's what made me realize I needed to know more about what was going on in that kind of political and economic environment at that time. We talked about A Nation at Risk, that report that was delivered by the Reagan Education Office, how that kind of had an impact that turned into eventually No Child Left Behind, and a whole bunch of dominoes fell after that and then that kind of American political system with regard to the educa- public education. But anyway, this is definitely a book from a from a more left-leaning political angle. It's examining how a sort of wealthy conservative ideology attempted to take over the American political dialogue. Interesting book. Learned a lot about a bunch of history that I didn't know. I went and did deep dives about some of the stories that I learned reading it (laughs) and still learning about it. The other book that I read was Poverty by America by Matthew Desmond, explores systematic economic and social policies in the U.S. that tend to perpetuate poverty, calls for a collective effort to address and eliminate poverty. That was another one that had a lot of history in it. And then the last one that I thoroughly enjoyed, and we read this together, a book called The 90s by Chuck Klosterman, This is a cultural and social analysis of the 1990s, but it was really fun to revisit our very young childhoods at a time of extraordinary change, especially in the United States. And it's a pretty fun and sometimes funny retrospective on that decade and definitely worth a read, I would say. Did you enjoy that book? Yeah, it was fun. We listened to it in an audiobook form. It was on our drive back home from being out west last year in... It was really fun. It was actually, I think probably the funniest part was, was that every time they would bring up something, Chelsea would pause it and go, do you remember that? <laughs> Did I do that? Uh-huh. Oh. And I was like, yeah, mm-hmm. I remember that. <laughs> I was there too. Well, it's just so exciting to hear about things I hadn't heard about in decades. I was yeah. very, I was very into it. It was just really funny because oh, wow, I'm we sorry would be driving that. and listening and then all of a sudden I would hear her hit the pause button and I was like, I already know it's coming. <laughs> big fan of the pause button i gotta talk it through Mm, you're not as big a fan of the the pause button as you should be normally you start talking and then i say hold on and then we hit pause and then you may continue sometimes my brain is going a little too fast Um, and forgets to hit the pause button i will admit that chuck clarkson is a great writer i've read other things of his and and he's just really great i hadn't before this so he's very talented it was just it was a really fun read an audiobook, especially format, what made it really fun for uh-huh. us. Um, but yeah, I would say my favorite part of driving home was every 30-ish minutes. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? <laughs> and I would always, I always knew it was coming. I'm sorry I put you through that. No, it was fun. It, it made the conversation better, but it, it was just, it was fun. It's a good book. <laughs> As a child of the 90s, it was, it was really wonderful to be back. Yeah. And the cover of it is a, uh, a see-through house phone. Like yes. The, I had one the multicolored. Of those. I'm pretty sure that I. Do you remember that? I think. 
Oh, I was going to say, I think I might have gotten it at a Scholastic Book Fair as like a prize. You know what I'm talking about? Were you... I definitely wanted one and never had one. I think I might have gotten one at a book fair. I'm not sure that it ever actually worked. I and remember also, it rattled when I shook it. They all did. Oh, okay. I think that was like their thing. Okay. They were falling apart in real time. Yeah. It's like in Juno when she's like, hold on, I can't hear you. I'm yes. on my hamburger phone. It was just like that. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, uh, a really fun book. And Klaus Schumann is a great writer. Why don't you do your next two and then we'll talk about the last one together. First one, I've been learning and utilizing the American Library Association, the ALA, to help write better policies to support teachers in the classroom for like AI use or other types of academic dishonesty or integrity concerns, Mm -hmm. and then also helping write book selection criteria. And so big fan of the ALA. We've talked about them before, I know, but spent the last six months doing a little bit deeper work with that. Yeah. Still have a lot to learn. They also have real human beings you can call and talk they to. They do. Yeah. It's yeah, not just uh, online yeah, they have stuff. Humans. Yeah. You can actually talk to real humans at the ALA. They employ very nice humans, actually. They do. Um, so, knew about them, but learning more and writing better policies. Cool. And my last one will surprise no one who knows me. Yeah. This is not the first time you've talked about this animal on the show. And nor will it be the last. <laughs> there was this spring... A white buffalo calf born in Yellowstone National Park. Is that rare? Super rare. Really? Actually, the white buffalo calf is sacred among the Lakotas, the American Indians. Oh. And it is a sign to begin life's sacred loop. It brings a sense of hope and is a sign that good times are about to happen. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. It's so wild to yeah, see. Yeah, I saw a picture. A white calf. Um, and it was in Yellowstone, right? It was, and buffalo calves are called red dogs. So I guess yeah. this is a white dog. I guess so. He's very cute. Or she. I'm actually not sure what it is, but okay. I'll include a link to a press release. And together, yes, we combine our powers. We do. We saw stuffs. We did. We went to New York to see sh- she chefs. We recently met up with the women we met last summer Yes, at the Joni Mitchell concert. We all reunited in New York City. Based on the fact that we all wanted to see Suffs, yeah, a Broadway play by Shayna Taub. I realized, shamefully, how little I knew yeah. about the American suffragist movement, mm-hmm. the people involved in it, the politics of the time. Oh my gosh. The players that play. Mm-hmm. Just an incredible story. I did not prepare myself for the emotional baggage of, of that show. It was... I was weeping we were sitting in the very back row of the orchestra pit and it's a good thing because i'd i was a blubbering mess we at intermission three of the our friends were sitting in front of us and then there were three of us behind them and so i like see them handing each other tissues and i'm like oh thank god and i already could tell that chelsea had been crying oh yeah i couldn't see if the woman beside you kim was crying or not and so are we just like having a moment like what and then they turned around and they had been like crying. And then I look at Kem and she was crying. And so then I'm like, give me a tissue. And it was hilarious because we're all sitting there covered in tears. The women coming up from the lower seating were yes. like, oh, it's not just us. Great. No, no. Like, no, it's all. And, and yeah. so that was just an intermission. It doesn't even cover the tears I cried later oh, over had, cheesecake. It hadn't even gotten to like probably the most grueling part of the show yet, which was in the second half with the they're in, the suffragists are imprisoned and they're treated horribly. Mm. And uh, oh man! So just to summarize really quickly, yes. what the show is yes, based on the struggle between Suffs, Alice Paul and Carrie Chapman Cat to try to persuade President Woodrow Wilson to push for the right for women to vote. So while the play follows the struggle between the young Paul and the aging cat, we also see Ida B. Wells step in to remind the women that the fight for women to vote needs to expand beyond just white women. And so I'm not going to give all of the history because that's the fun part for sure. But the timeline for women trying to obtain rights to vote and just to, you know, be able to have any say in their lives really started in America as early as 1847. And they were not provided the opportunity to vote until 1920. With the passage of the 19th Amendment, it did not address the poll tax or the literacy test that would prevent many black women from voting up through the rest of the 20th century. Yeah. Or for most of the 20th century. Yeah. So. Yep. I didn't know enough. Oh my gosh. I still don't know enough. I knew so little. I I want to know more. I was so called out. There's a moment in the show where a new 
player in the equal the fight for equal rights comes along and she asks about one of our four mothers. She asks about a suffragist from a couple generations behind her. She's like, who is that? And the, it had been a main character in the first show, the first act of the show. And, and it's just like, I... It was calling me out so hard. And one of Alice Paul's dear friends, and that's who she's speaking to. Yes. And uh, I just missed it. And I I was like, man, I don't don't know this stuff. I should know this stuff, and I don't know this stuff. I think it's way more powerful at this level of personal narrative that gets introduced through the show. When you when you feel like you're a part of real people's lives and you're not just talking about it in this kind of like broad political movement sort of way, Mm -hmm. when you realize the material impact on women's lives that this movement had and the the material impact it continues to have. We learned a lot. We learned so much. It was a good year. I committed last year to get back to reading more and I also committed to finding things that I actually wanted to read about rather mm-hmm. than just kind of like blowing in the wind and going wherever the recommendation engine sent me. I decided I wanted to learn about certain things and I Went and did that. Yeah, it's been a good, it's good been feeling. A good year of learning. Yeah, I think you and I both value learning, even as adults, and unlearning. Yeah, and that's not easy, but it is worthwhile. I think I said that earlier, talking about Brian Stevenson's book, and I try to make sure that what I'm learning challenges what I think I know. So, for sure, our last little bit, our trivia section. Before I take the best decongestant <laughs> I can find. <laughs> All right. Or fill in the blank. Do you have last week's question? Would you like to read I that? I can. Um, okay. This is the portion of the show where you email us the answer. Yes. We send you stickers. We do. 16 to 1 stickers. We've got them. Right into us. Hello at 16 to 1.com. And Terry, I know you're listening. And I know you know these answers. And so please, please write in so I can send you stickers. Last episode. Here we go. June 6, 2024 marked the 80th anniversary since the Normandy landings during World War II. In 1944, the Allies invaded Normandy in what is still considered to be the largest seaborne invasion in history. We know this event as D-Day, but what was its code name? And it was called Operation Neptune. Oh, wow. I would not have gotten that one right at trivia. No, I wouldn't have either. Okay. I didn't know that one until that. What you got for this episode? Tony Awards just happened, uh, and as you all know, we love Broadway. So the Tony Awards were awarded for the first time in 1947. And since 1947, Hamilton has been nominated for the most Tony Awards of all time, with a total of 16 nominations. The Producers has won the most Tonys with 12. That one surprised me a lot, actually. Not that I don't think The Producers is a fun show. Can I tell you a funny story about that? Sure. When I was in high school, Uh we used to go on two New York trips, Uh like, every year. We Uh went every other year. And one year they took us to The Producers and we left at intermission. Oh, no. Because of the content. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Y- that's a show about which you got to do your research. You do. Anyways, carry on. It is built for perhaps adults, uh, adults, adult learners. <laughs> um. Anyway, okay. For whom are the Tonys named? For whom does the bell of the Tonys <laughs> ring? For whom does the Tony bell toll? This woman was an American actress, producer, director, and administrator known for her work in theater. She was co-founder and secretary of the American Theater Wing. Got any final thoughts? Wrap up? Oh, no. Parting shots? No, no. No? Mm-mm. Ready to call it? I'm ready to call it's it. It's been a great year. It, it has, has been, been a great year. Thanks for sticking with us. Thanks for sticking with uh, Moonbeam Multimedia as we grow and expand and take on new challenges. And thank you for all that you do to make the podcast go. And thank you for all that you do to make the podcast go. We will see you all in two weeks. Talk to you in two weeks. Listeners, thanks for supporting 16 to 1. We're your co-hosts. I'm Chelsea Adams. And I'm Katie Day. Find our show notes, archives, and resources, sign up for our newsletter, or get in touch with us via the contact form at 16to1.com, all spelled out. We are so grateful for our listener support. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing to the show and telling your friends or colleagues about it. The show is edited and produced by you, Chelsea Adams, and you're also responsible for our show's music. And you, Katie Day, serve as lead researcher and social media manager. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. Oh.
Are you okay? There she goes! <laughs> it always goes, like, a little bit further than a uh, Can you set, like, a lock point on it? Or does it just go? I don't know. You did this. Well, you can... Ooh! Oh, oh no! <laughs> that was much work. She's going over. 